the home of jump racing. This is where the magic happens. Feel like a Cheltenham favourite with Paddy Power. Hello everybody, welcome to Road to Cheltenham. Now there are two things that you need to know about this particular edition. The first is that this is the show where we focus on the novice hurdling action from the festive period. And the second thing you need to know is that my co-driver today is not Ruby Walsh, it's Danny Mullins. Danny, welcome to the show. Great to be on. Are you looking forward to it? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, from what I've seen so far, I follow it through the year and it seems to be a great production and big boots to fill, but hopefully we'll get through it well. That's very kind of you and flattery will get you absolutely everywhere. So good start. Excellent start. Um, let's move straight on to um, the social polls, shall we? We ask our roadies um, a question about you, actually, just to settle you in and get the inside track. And we asked them, which of Danny Mullins' key mounts over the holiday period do you fancy most for Cheltenham and why? And overwhelmingly, they went for Flooring Porter ahead of Stormy Island and from Tornado Flyer. But a few of them had an interesting suggestion as something else. But let's take it from your point of view about Flooring Porter. Um, Charlie Sharp was talking about that start and the fact that Classical Dream uh, was gifted eight lengths um, at the start. Um, and he and Damo agree um, that that was the the difference between winning and losing. Do you see it that way? I think so. I, I don't think the particular distance, while I wouldn't want to be uh, losing that distance again in Cheltenham, but the fact that Paul Townend got track position um, through the middle part of the race, maybe Classical Dream over raced in parts as Paul tried to ease off, I got up onto his skirts to keep him honest and you know, test his fitness as much as I could, but where Lauren Porter maybe wasn't able to challenge in the straight, he just wouldn't move off the rail. And mm. had I been on the rail, I think, I don't know if I would have beaten Lauren or Classical Dream, but I think I would have given him a real race for it. And going to Cheltenham last year, it was only a ride for me maybe in the 11th hour. So mm. I, I'd looked at him beforehand and I thought he wouldn't handle the new course where there's all the island hurdles but riding him on the day he was fine and he actually galloped straighter so i think uh yeah going to cheltenham you know all things square i'll give classical plenty to think about we respect him we don't fear him and throwing porter himself he's always been quirky has that got any worse or is he just exactly the same as it's always been no, he's been the same from, from what I've gathered. I've only joined the team late. You know, Gavin and all of his team at home have been minding him for a good few years. Obviously, he started off as a quite lowly rated handicapper and progressed all the way through last season. One, from this year, you know, he was a little bit fuzzy early in Navin, took his fall, but learned a lot from that. He was very professional in Leopardstown the last day and even through the middle part of the race. You know, I, I didn't want to get locked in a battle with Paul and have the two of us set it up for a closer. You know, even even when they were going a bit quicker, he was intelligent enough to, just to ease off and, and press on as I wanted. The only thing that can be a slight issue is steering, but, you know, he, he seemed to handle the track in Cheltenham last year, which I would have questioned having never ridden the horse before. But the fact that he went around it last year, I think he'll be fine again this year. Okay. Well, let's move on to Tornado Flyer and Tracy Doxy wanted to vote for him, but ended up voting other instead. Uh, we all make mistakes. Um, uh, we, we, I certainly do. There'll be plenty during the course of this show, no doubt. Tell me about that really well judged ride in the King George on Tornado Flyer and how you think that's going to translate to something like the Gold Cup. Yeah, the King George was obviously a very strong gallop. We knew on paper going into the race that they were going to go quite quick. And... Tornado, you know, got into a nice rhythm and from halfway, I thought I was travelling very well once we turned down the back and the way he started to jump through the middle part of the race is what impressed me most. I've ridden him in the rain air and the marsh around Cheltenham before where he'd run, run solid races, but always at two and a half miles, I just thought he was flat out and 
needing to get a good jump to put him in a position where he could attack and could never really get there. Where in King George, it was the first time I'd ridden him over three miles. He'd had one previous run and disappointed at three miles. But for me, the way he moved into a challenging position down the back straight, uh, I was quite impressed with that. You know, maybe they went a bit quick and the race fell into his lap, but I don't think there was any stamina doubt. Hampton can be a speed track, but they had a lot of rain and it was a proper test around on that day. So I think, I hope he can stay the extra distance in the Gold Cup that last two furlongs. Nobody truly knows what will happen there, but I think how he showed he, he was in his comfort zone through the middle part of the race in Kempton, that gives him a big chance of running a good race in the Gold Cup. There were a couple of errors early on, and that's not unknown from him. Will he be OK in the Gold Cup in the early stages? Because it doesn't tend to be the kind of race where you can make up ground from the back. You know, I, I think he'll be OK. You know, often in his races, he can get a bit high over the first few fences. And... Before the race in Kempton, I asked Willie, could I jump him off a little bit closer so that if I did lose a couple of lengths at one of the early fences, I'd still be in the position I wanted to be from flagfall. And in Kempton, he made a mistake at the first, a little bit high at the second and warmed up fine then. But, you know, it's it's a flat speed track in Kempton. I, while they go a proper gallop down over the first couple in the Gold Cup, I don't think they'll be going quite that speed. And I think similar tactics uh, should leave us in the position we want to be, heading down the back and let the race warm up from there. Well, that was a gloriously well-judged ride from the back. You also uh, managed to win the Rail Keel with a really well-judged ride from the front and plenty of people voted for Stormy Island. Not surprisingly, FB Racing Club, the owners of Stormy Island since you returned to Willie Mullins Yard, was one of them. Um, and they are saying that our girl never gets the credit that she deserves and they're arguing that she's better than ever. Um, and Cathal McHugh agrees with them, saying, I don't understand why she isn't clear favourite for the Close Brothers Mare's Hurdle. Now, she's been second to Roxana, fifth to Honeysuckle. Do you think she's better than ever? Better than ever? Possibly. She's definitely in as good a shape as she's ever been. You know, she she won in Fairy House last year, grade two against the Geldings, maybe getting a bit tired at the finish. Stepped up on that in Punchestown to run away with the Mayor's Hurdle. Came back again against Honeysuckle and just disappointed. But that was too bad to be true. The Rel Keel hurdle was a proper decent race, you know, to, to be a fabulous. Uh, I thought it was a, a real good performance. And what I liked about her in Cheltenham the last day was through the middle part of the race, while she burned down the home straight, once we turned away from the stands and I just eased off the gas a little bit and she listened to me. She, she's done very intelligent how she races through the middle part now, which makes it a lot easier to control a race from the front. And even if somebody was to go by her, I don't think she's going to tear off like she would have maybe back in her juvenile days. That's really interesting because that's the key, isn't it? I mean, it's one thing being able to control a smaller race like the Rail Keel and quite another thing in, in at the festival. It's interesting that she's become more tractable. That would give you much more concrete hope for it, I would have thought. You'd like to think so. Um, you know, the only thing I'd like to be able to keep a hold of now is Paul Townend and he wants to be getting back on her. But <laughs> I'll cross those bridges when we get there. I'll try to find a better one for him and convince him. <laughs> you'll, you'll have to find something. <laughs> so, something will have to fit being in full form. Um, the... the the Raiders also uh, put forward a horse that I was kind of hoping that they would to ask you about. And this is En Beton, who won the Punchestown Beginners Chase on New Year's Eve. And um, Thomas Fortune said that he jumped really well for the most part. And he thought that that was a, a really, a really strong performance from the horse. What, what did you think? Yeah, I thought it was a good performance from him too. You know, early on, you know, jumped out handy down the middle of the track and just the way he attacked those first few fences was very good for a horse to have jump in his first few fences in public you know he's such a big horse that you'd always think he's the ideal type for a chaser but the speed in which he can get from a to b he lands running every fence he was jumping i was able to just sit up 
fill him up a little bit again. And, you know, maybe he got a little bit tired late in the race, but he had everything burned off. I think with natural improvement from Punchestown, he could be a real contender for possibly the National Hunt chase, you would think, off the back of Punchestown. But then the more you get into it, the speed in which he gets from A to B over fences, the RSA could be an option as well. You know, he's going to hold his ground with that slick jumping in an RSA, but stamina will be no issue to go for the National Hunt chase. Yeah, interesting. Well, Daddy Hurt, who's um, replied to us, really likes 12 to 1 for, for the National Hunt chase, thinks it would be very fair. Clearly, one more would, run would be needed in order to um, qualify. Uh, but the thing about the National Hunt chase is it tends to reward a lot of experience. And that was only his first start over fences, his sixth start overall. So I wonder whether the uh, brand advisory, the old RSA, might end up being a, a good option for him. What Experience wise, it can, it can be a very... Um, difficult race, the National Hunt Chase. Yeah, very true. And the fact that Willie Mullins has on the ropes in the same ownership who won the Munster National, maybe got caught a bit flat-footed in the Ladbroke Trophy in Newbury. He looks one that could be an ideal type for the race as yeah. well. So it'll be interesting to see how they split those up come Cheltenham. Of course, there's a certain Gallopin de Champ in the yard as, as well, who could be anywhere between um, the Turners and the Brand Advisory. How impressed were you with him at Leopardstown? He was very good. You know, you, you couldn't but be blown away from what he showed on the day. But, you know, stepping in against grade one horses, I'd like to see what he can do. I presume he's going to go for the Dublin Festival and see what he'll do under pressure. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's easy to put the ball around at home, but, you know, when somebody's laying into you, that changes it a little bit. I think he'll come through it, but he still needs to prove it. Absolutely. Um, and, and finally, is there one horse from the Christmas period that we haven't discussed there, and perhaps we're not going to discuss later in the show, that has impressed you, that might be a little bit of left field suggestion? Yeah, I suppose we're not talking about bumper horses, but at Leopardstown at Christmas, Willie Mullins, you know, he won all the bumpers, but the one that particularly caught my eye was Redemption Day. You know, he was a smart four-year-old, won quite nicely, and he's one that I'd be keeping my eye on going forward. He could be a real festival hope. Okay, interesting stuff. Thank you very much, Danny, for all of that insight. Now we're going to move on to the novice hurdlers. So then we've split up the novice hurdlers into sections and for the purpose of ease, really, we've split them up into the Cheltenham Festival novice hurdle races. Now, clearly, these demarcations are still very fluid. There are some very important races coming up this weekend at the Dublin Racing Festival and over here in Britain and things could change. But we're going to start with the horses that at this stage could well be heading towards the Sky Bet Supreme. And the obvious place to start, Danny, is with Constitution Hill after that superb performance back to Sandown to win the Tollworth. What did you make of this? Yeah, he was very, very impressive. You know, I, I'm looking through the race, trying to find some holes in, in what he'd done there. But, you know, you look at him, the first hurdle in the back straight, Maybe met it on a little bit of a half stride, but very clever. You know, got up, got away from it, jumped the next couple fine. And then the last hurdle in the back straight, he was just in tight, but very quick away from that again. You know, the way Nico rode him, just put him in the slot behind. It probably helped by a truly run race that he was able to settle and follow away. But as you turn into the straight, he's just head and shoulders above the opposition jumps the second last well and quickens again away from the last and stand down on heavy ground to be able to do that up the hill that's a very taken performance sometimes you look at a tall bird hurdle you see novices grinding it out in that last furlong but the way he quickened again he couldn't but be taken with the performance I think that's right. There's something about the energy in which he's finished up his races both times at Sandan that has been particularly taking. And uh, Nicky Henderson has been interesting about the horse as well and saying that his temperament and constitution is just remarkable. He sounds like he's completely unflappable and that too is going to be an asset. Yeah, definitely. You know, come Cheltenham, 
supreme novice, you know, first race, uh, loads of horses can get boiled over, you know, before it. And the fact that he's got that great temperament, it's a big asset to his armory. It's funny you should mention that, and I promise this show is not rehearsed, but there's been a chat about that, the, the buzz before the Supreme, vis-a-vis John Bond, the stable companion of Constitution Hill. Uh, Mark Edmo and Paul Corcoran have been debating this, and they're worried about John Bond's nerves against the Supreme roar. Is it particularly different, the first day to the second? I, I, I know all, this, all that pent-up anticipation for the first race of the festival after you've waited so long to see it, but... You know, might that be a factor between choosing races? I don't think so. I suppose maybe if you're worrying about John Bond getting excited early in the race, I think come Cheltenham, there, there's going to be no hiding place in the Supreme. The flag will fall and they'll attack early. John Bond so far, he's been in races where they haven't gone a gallop and he's ended up making most of the running himself. And, you know... Nicky Henderson, he's got two proper novice hurdlers here. And when I've gone through these horses, I, I'm slightly siding with John Bond, even though it was a steadily run race in Ascot the last day. The way he hurdles, he, he's just so low and fast, where Constitution Hill is quite a good jumper and efficient. But you're looking at John Bond and thinking, he doesn't leave an inch to spare. He's just so fast away from his hurdles. Down the hill in Ascot, you know, he was having to make his own running again. He was very accurate, turned into the straight. Everything was really starting to spin the wheels behind him. And he's just lengthening again. It's like, you know, watching a good footballer at ease. He's just doing things as he likes. Yeah. I tend to agree, and I think maybe the temperament thing is a bit overplayed with John Bond because in the races himself, themselves, he's been absolutely fine and that there hasn't been much pace on. People are debating about whether um, Nicky Henderson will split them up. Duncan Simpson and John Sharp have been doing so. Um, Duncan mentioned that uh, Nicky Henderson ran Altier and Bouvaudaire in the Supreme against each other in 2016, Spirit Sun and Sprinter Sacra together in 2011. Um, John Sharp remembers um, some examples as well, but they've also split them up. Simon Sig uh, went for the what's now the Ballymore in 2012 with Dalan for the Supreme. What? W- w- where would you go? It sounds like you think that John Bond is tailor made for the Supreme. Would you split them up or would you let them go at each other for the for the sake of competition? It's a difficult one to decide. You know, the fact that Constitution Hill has won around a real stiff track on heavy ground, he would be the one you could go stepping up and trip, go for the 2-5. But, you know, the way he won the Talworth, I think he deserves his crack at a Supreme. And the fact that they're both in or owned by two different people, you know, the, they'll both want to have a go. Everybody, you know, goes to Cheltenham. That first race, the Supreme is the novice hurdle you really want to win. You know, there, there's nothing wrong with going up and trip, but the Supreme is the fancy race. And, you know, if I was the trainer, I think I maybe have a better chance of winning boat races if they split up. But if I own one of the horses, I'm thinking I want my go at the Supreme. Well, um, Thomas Devlin brought this debate to a sort of punchy clothes by saying um, that the two horses from Nicky Henderson will be a close second and third to Sir Gerhard which provides us with a a very good segue. I mean, when we think about the drubbing that British trained horses got by Ireland at the last Cheltenham Festival, it seemed a bit unlikely that we'd have the first and second favourite for the Supreme. There is a certain Sir Gerhard who's got to play his real cards because we've only seen him once over hurdles. He made his debut at Leopardstown over Christmas. What did you make of it? Yeah, it was a solid debut. You know, he had to make his own run again. Um, like some of the other novices had, you know, he jumped out, maybe a little bit keen in Paul Townend's hands early, turning down the back, the first hurdle in the back straight, he was just a little bit deliberate, and you're looking, thinking, just sharpen up, fella, here now, you're just going to need to step it up, then down to the third last, he's a little bit slow away from that again, but swing around the bend into the home, straight and he jumped the second last well and down to the last he's getting in tight to it Paul has a good hold of his head but he's very fast away from that at that point you're thinking this fella is really starting to learn from what he's done here today if he can get a little bit more experience at the Dublin Festival 
he'll be ready to lock on with the good English horses. I think the English horses are ahead at the moment. But what Sir Gerhard learned, even through the race in Leopardstown, I think he's going to be catching up fast. And the fact that he, you know, he won the bumper in Cheltenham last year, he likes the track, he showed he has the speed. You know, if he can brush up a little more, he's going to be banging into the mix and give it a good a go for the Irish. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. I mean, having controlled the race, he came home really strongly. And like you, I like that there was a promise of a very good technique towards the, the end of that race. Interesting that Willie Mullins was saying that he was even thinking about throwing him straight into a grade one. We have a look at the Sky Bet Supreme Novices betting, and these are Paddy Power's prices. Constitution Hill is nine to four. Um, John Bond is three to one. Those are the longest prices you can get about either of the of the British train runners. Uh, but they're more cautious with Sir Gerhard at five to one let's move on to a horse that's a bigger price in that list and that is mighty potter and i really liked his win in the paddy power future champions novice hurdle what did you make of this performance danny at leopardstown yeah it was a good performance in leopardstown turning across the top um jack is just following away grungy moves up on the outside uh jumps by him and just lost his slot a little bit there once he's got a bit of daylight in the home straight, he's really started to lengthen again. Maybe still looks a little bit raw in what he's doing, but was never going to get beat. And just the question mark I have about Mighty Potter is, you know, just that tactical speed as the race really starts to unfold. It's probably what got him beat in Fairy House as well. Now he ended up, you know, down the rail in Fairy House. The winner came from down the rail also, but she had more speed to go on through to beat my mate Mozzie, where Mighty Potter just needs to get sharper, at, you know, when, as the race unfolds, you know, coming down the hill in the Supreme, things are going to be happening fast. He's going to want to be able to hold his position there. I think he'll be staying on well again at the finish, but I don't know if he's going to sharpen enough, you know, to remain in position where he can have a go at winning could he have a Ballymore option I tend to agree with what you're saying now and I just wonder whether the team will look at this race look at the potential depth of it I mean it might depend on what Nicky Henderson does with his two and think well maybe we might go to the Ballymore yeah going for a Ballymore it would just bring stamina into the case a little bit more and you'd have to think he might just be better suited by that I don't know on what we've seen so far has he got the speed for a Supreme? Yeah. And I know we're going to talk about the mares later on in the show, but Grand G ran in that race. And what did you make of her performance in it? It was a solid run from Grand G. You know, she moved up and looked as if uh, she was the winner all over off the bend, but just flattened out a little bit from there. Maybe a bit disappointing, but going back against the mares, uh, I, I think she, she'd have a good chance. You know, she's, the mayor's novice, it'll be a competitive race again, but, you know, she, she's a decent mayor. She was sixth in the Cheltenham bumper last year. So I think, um, yeah, she, she's a nice one going forward, but mayor's company is probably where she's at her best. There's another one from Willie Mullins' yard to mention, and that is El Fabiolo, who ran at Tremor on New Year's Day. Uh, Willie Mullins immediately compared him to Penhill, Samoa and Lorena, all of whom won at Tremor before going on to win various races at the Cheltenham Festival. What did you make of El Fab Fabiolo's performance? I wonder, did Willie have that rehearsed beforehand? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I thought it was good. There was nothing... Not much strength and depth to the race, but, you know, he, he couldn't have done it any more impressively. And it's, Tremor is, it's the opposite way around to Cheltenham, but it's an up and down track, hurdles come at you fast. And to see such a tall horse jump and gallop so well, he was quite balanced around Tremor. I'd like what the horse done on the day, but... As regards saying he's going to win on the Cheltenham off the back of that, don't know if the performance good enough to be jumping up and down just yet, but the potential is there. Yeah, absolutely. And Samoa took that race on route to win 
in the county hurdle back in uh, 2020. Um, there's another race we should talk about from Leopardstown that involved Watch House Cross. Uh, it's the race in which State Man and Hiao didn't finish. What did you make of this? Yeah, it was, you know, it was only beginning to develop really as, you know, halfway down the back, um, Paul is quite happy, maybe fifth, sixth on statement, traveling and jumping well. He's starting to move up as they turn the bend for the second last. And you're thinking, is this going to be one of Willie's star novice hurdlers being unleashed and tips up? Um, had Grangie tipped up at the same point, you'd think she should be bang there in the supreme. You know, it's too far from home to really know what statement or how would have done that day. So, um, question marks. Okay. Um, and so finally, just to wrap up this section, there's clearly a very significant race coming up at this weekend, the Skybet Moscow Flyer Novice Hurdle. At this stage, the likes of Dice at Dynamo, um, Hawaii Game, um, Guiley Billy and Gringo Dorbrell, who was third in the challenge, and we'll come back to that performance later in the show, they're all entered. Do you have a, have a view here? I mean, it tends to be a very important race, this. It does, and Dice at Dynamo definitely looks to be a, a very nice horse. He was a little bit raw in Cork. Uh, first hurdle, you know, he's again with these good novices, you know, not a lot of horses are, are able to go the gallop they want to go early in a race. So the fact that he didn't have a lead down in Cork didn't help him. He ran around a little at the first, maybe a bit awkward at the second. Uh, but once he swung down the back, he was starting to really attack his hurdles and go forward. You know, and you watch him with a bit of speed down, you know, the third last, he was good, picked up and went away again. The last, he was a little bit awkward at the jump, but I liked how fast he got away from it. Mm -hmm. He was starting to learn and sharpen up as he'd go. He, he's a big horse and you know, a little bit immature still. I, I think the Punchestown will need to sharpen him up more again. There's a lot of potential there, but he's just not quite the finished article yet that John Bond Constitution Hill are, you know. And maybe that's just the fact that Willie's horses are just that little bit behind yeah. through the early part of the winter without the rain. And you know, they're really starting to pick up. It wouldn't worry me, but you just have to watch what they're doing over their next couple of runs to see. It's relatively easy to make that first step, but as you get a little bit higher up the ladder, it becomes more difficult and the potential is there, but they have to go and do it. I agree with that point. I think that they're there could be quite a lot of volatility, more volatility than usual um, in the sort of uh, novice hurdle rankings because of that um, delay that people have had, the holdups that they've had at the early part of the season. Right, well, that is the state of the Supreme. In the next section, we're going to move on to the Ballymore. So the Ballymore and the logical place to start there, I think, Danny, is the Lawless of Nace, which was won by Jinto beating Grand Jury with some promise from Hollow Games as well back in third. What was your take on this race? Yeah, it, it looked, I rode in the race, it rode a, a decent type of race, but didn't go mad gallop early on. And Jinto was a good winner, but a slight question mark about Jinto, he, he has that tendency to jump a little bit to his right. Now, it's not alarming, but, you know, even across the bottom, Davy Russell is following on Hollow Games. And as they jump the third last hurdle, if you watch where Hollow Games lands behind Jinto, Jinto has obviously just jumped that little bit right again. And once they come down to the bend, it's just got a little bit tight for Hollow Games. And as the race is starting to develop, he loses two or three lengths there. Now, stays on nicely again in the straight. But looking at that, thinking, had Hollow Games been bang on Jinto's tail, would the race have changed a little bit more? Would you be jumping up and down as much about Jinto? Now, I think Jinto... As soon as something presses him, he goes again. But I'd like to see Hollow Games get a real crack at him. 
It's interesting because I've in the in the column that I wrote this week, I put up Hollow Games for the Albert Bartlett. I was really impressed with this performance. I liked the way he knuckled down when things were going against him. And David Russell had basically said to Gordon Elliott, given his time again, he wouldn't have gone down the inside, and that he felt that you know he wasn't able to use his stride. The horse was he? Not really, but you know. Davy says he wouldn't have gone down the inside, but it was probably the right thing to do to remain down the inside, knowing the fact that Ginto was going to be jumping off the rail a little bit in front of him. Circumstance came against him on the day, but while you can't knock Ginto's performance, Hollow Games is probably the one you're going to take out of that race. And how about what do you want afterwards? Willie Mullen said he got involved in that schmuzzle that you've described three out, um, and maybe the, the horse probably needs to be ridden more positively. Possibly so, you know, it, it hampered his chances at the incident. But what maybe disappointed me for what you want was just the last furlong. He wasn't really making ground again. And, you know, in Navin on a, his previous start, he really attacked, uh, he hit the line very well, where in this, he just flattened out a little bit, you know. The mistake maybe cost him a chance of being in a winning position down the straight, but I would have liked to see him stay on a bit better. Yeah, OK, fair enough. Let's move on to um, Journey With Me success. And this, of course, involved Kilcruck being beaten again. Let's start with the winner. What did you make of Journey With Me? Journey With Me, yes. He looks exciting at the moment. You know, a little bit raw as well, uh, I think. The second hurdle, just very slow at that. Started to warm up as the race developed. Halfway down the back, the hurdle he just got very low at, and but got away from it nicely. He turned in to the straight, and you think Kilcroft is all over him, but just puts down his head and gallops on strongly again. You know, Kilcroft, he's just been disappointing this year so far. Can I can I ask about Kilcroft because there's a, there's just a bit if you have a look at what he does in at Cheltenham and also in victory at Punchestown, there's a point where he's under pressure where he, he just looks to sort of wobble about a bit and, and think about it. I mean, is there a physical issue? You know, can I mention the heresy of of headgear? Could it be something like that? I don't think Willie would go for headgear, but. You know, it's interesting, Willie, you know, he's openly said he doesn't train him quite as hard as some of his other horses. And maybe the fact that, you know, getting into the spring, it will have, it'll have a lot more training gone into him at that stage where he doesn't particularly put the gun to his head too early in the season. Back on a bit of nice ground, I think he can improve, but he needs to improve. He's, he's just, you know, you'd forgive him Cork getting beat, but what uh, disappointed me maybe in Leopardstown was the fact that Journey with me and Manella Crooner, if you watch the two of those and their position off the home bend, there may be 10 lengths between them and Kilcross is up with Journey with me. By the time you get to the finish, uh, Manella Crooner is maybe closing a little more, but the gap is relatively the same. And Kilcott has been the one who's dropped out of it. I don't know, has it been the journey with me has quickened again relative to Manella Crooner, where Kilcott has just died that bit late on, which was disappointing. Yeah, I, I don't think he found very much and Manella Crooner didn't even jump that well and managed to get up ahead of him for second. Let's move on to classic getaway. You thwarted any ideas about this horse making a winning debut over hurdles. You were on board his stable companion Cashback. Talk me through this race at Clonmel. Yeah, in Clonmel, I rode Cashback, uh, jumped out, made the run and, and looking at classic getaway, he was just that little bit fresh and keen Early in the back straight, uh, gone, gone up the back first time. He just wasn't a little bit keen with Paul. And he's jumping well all the way across the top. But as they run down into the home straight, downhill run in Clamell, he just started to run in Paul's hands again. And, you know, it's heavy ground. We're not flying along. And the fact that he's just that little bit fresh, I suppose Paul 
has you know, taken taken over the lead and made the sensible choice as he settled well in front after that. And but maybe just burnt himself a little bit too much early in the race. And coming down the hill, cashback, you know, is I've just sat and waited for one go at him. Mm. I, I wasn't going to make it easy for Paul to maybe get into a battle and get a, away from me again later on. So I, I wanted to play from my point of view, play tactically, so the, the only option was I quicken and get by him. Had, had there been a, a battle earlier, Paul might have came back at me again. But when you're looking at a novice getting beaten, I think this, I'd be quick enough to forgive Classic Getaway here. You know, he, he's taken on a 140 hurdler, well, ex-hurdler, that, you know, had a run as well. Cashback had, had that run in Cork. And, you know, I think there's still a lot to like about Classic Getaway. Even though he ran keen through the early part of the race, his jumping held up. He was very slick jumping, got from A to B well. And, you know, going forward, I wouldn't give up on this fella. A lot of people drew a line from him. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, I think he's rather burdened by his price tag, isn't he? But, you know, I think it was no disgrace to be beaten by uh, cashback, particularly in those circumstances. How about O'Toole in Down Royal? Afterwards, Stuart Quilford was saying that this could be a future Gold Cup horse. What did you make of his performance? Yeah, everybody, you know, has to have the dream. You can't knock the horse. But there wasn't much strength and depth to the race. He picked up and won well, but he's going to have to step up a little bit more to prove, you know, his bumper form is probably more solid than what he achieved in his maiden hurdle without getting anything wrong. Okay, it'll be interesting to see what he does next. More substantial form, naturally, it was a grade one, was the Chalo Hurdle, and that was won by Stage Star, who maintained his unbeaten record over hurdles. The mayor, West Balboa, followed him home, and Gringo Dorbrell, Gordon Elliott, had sent over that horse. What did you make of the way that this race panned out? Yeah, it was a truly run race. You'd have to like stage star. You're looking at him thinking, it, is there many chinks in his armour? And he just seems to be very professional. Harry Cobden jumps out, handy down the inner, follows away. And the last hurdle in the back straight, as he landed over that, I'm not sure, did, did something, maybe a bit of kickback or something, hit him on the head or hit his ears? He shakes his head for a few strides there. but. Doesn't, it doesn't seem to affect him at all. He turns down into the straight. He's always kept up to his gallop. I, I think Harry knows this lad is, is not fast, but he's got a great cruising speed. And the further you get down the straight, the more you think this horse is just getting away from these easier and easier. You know, you're, you're trying to find things to where he can get beat, looking for a mistake at a hurdle. The only mistake he's made so far was at the second last in Newbury, the previous run. Harry asked him and he just put down. But even when he put down that day, the horse was very assured on what he was going to do. Didn't put a foot wrong in the shallow and ran out a very impressive winner. And yet Paul Nichols is saying, you know, may not go to Cheltenham, don't want to go to Cheltenham and finish fifth or sixth. This 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 performance has got to be right up there in terms of what, what the Ballymore currently looks like, hasn't it? I think so. You know, for me, I think Stage Star is more professional in what he's done so far than Ginto. You know, maybe Ginto would be better, you know, he's, previous run he had a lead around Navin Ginto and you know he looked a bit more professional than in Nace but stage star to me I think he's bang up there and maybe a little bit ahead of Ginto on what I've seen. Let's move on to New Year's Day at Cheltenham. Um, Hillcrest the mighty giant Hillcrest crest, saw off I am Maximus. I love this race I love the ride as well from Richard Patrick never once reaching for the stick and just relying on Hillcrest to find more against I am Maximus. Yeah, Hillcrest, you know, he's a fine big horse and that was a good performance in Cheltenham. You know, he was a bit slow, maybe jumped up in the air over the first hurdle, started to warm up more as the race developed. And, 
you know, down down into the home straight, I am Maximus gets up beside him. And yeah, you're thinking maybe it is I am Maximus going to get away from him, but as Hill's crest finds his stride up the hill, there was no stopping him. He just galloped very strong to the line. Now, looking at that, I'm thinking, is Hillcrest more of an Albert Bartlett horse than a Ballymore horse? I think he's got strength and stamina, which would come into play better for a crack at the Albert Bartlett for me. Mm. Maybe, possibly lacks a little bit of experience to that race, but he's going to get a little bit more in. He could go back to Cheltenham on trials day for a pretty similar race or he could go on the same day to Doncaster over three miles I am Maximus was buzzy beforehand but I don't think that lost him the race at all I mean that was a big big step forward I don't think you can blame his pre-race demeanor on his for, for his defeat no I don't think so and even through the middle part of the race I am Maximus you know I had to be ridden along a couple of times you know he was on and off the bridle there and um, but still got into it the position he needed to be to have a crack at winning off the, the home turn and just got beat by a good horse on the day. OK, so that is where it stands with the Ballymore. If we take a look at the betting, it's not quite such a well-formed market as the Supreme. Um, people with still having lots of choices about where they might send their horses, whether down in trip to the Supreme or up to the Albert Bartlett um, and looking ahead to the weekend we might learn a little bit more from Warwick where we've got the Levington novices hurdle there are the declarations and uh, it'll be interesting to see whether uh, one of those can step forward perhaps party business who uh, was staying on late when unfortunately tipping up behind stage star in the cello right that's the Ballyball let's move on to the Albert Bartlett <laughs> So now the stayers amongst the novices over three miles for the Albert Bartlett. This tends to be quite a tough race, Danny. It often rewards a lot of experience, at least as often as it does brilliance. Obviously, there's some, been some very good winners in the race, notably Minella Indo. Um, I wonder where, whether as a population, this the staying novices might be even kind of more behind than the others or that people haven't quite identified which horses should be going for this for this race just yet? Yeah, I don't think the race has really taken its true shape yet. And mm. I suppose that has been the stairs tend to want softer ground through the early part of the winter and they just haven't had that. So the horses you'd be picking for the likes of this race generally have quite a bit of experience, but maybe this season we're going to have a change with that and horses you know that are starting only still getting some of that experience are, are really starting to come to the fore now well let's take a look at, at three that might have put their head above the parapet over the christmas period the first of them is eric bloodax who went to limerick and won the graded race there in the end he was quite a comprehensive winner what did you make of him through the race yeah through the race he was good, you know, Brian Cooper elected to be down the inside early on, just missed one or two hurdles through, through the middle part of the race and could have maybe jumped a little bit sharper. But you're dealing with a three mile staying novice hurdler, you know, as, as Brian moved maybe to the middle of the track, going up the back straight the second time. It's just starting to pack up a little bit in front of them down the hill into the straight. You're thinking, is he going to meet a little bit of traffic here? Brian switched in and he's quickened again down to the second last to jump it nicely on down to the last. Gets a good jump at that again. And you're looking at the opposition behind them. They've all fallen away. And for a race that you're looking, turning in, thinking this is going to be very competitive, Eric Bloodax says he's just opened them up in the last furlong and ran out a, a very impressive winner. Yeah, he, he did possibly look much the best in that field, but Brian Keeper was saying afterwards that the ground wasn't entirely in his favour. I've got a couple more unexposed ones for you. Let's start with Bold Getaway. Um, but these are both trained by... Um, Gordon Elliott. Uh, Bold Getaway also won at Limerick. Yeah, Bold Getaway was good in Limerick, you know, tracked away middle of them down the inside and down to the second last, you're thinking you know, is, is he going to get a run through? But once he jumps the second last he 
he quickened quite nicely to be well on top, getting to the last hurdle and quickened again, going to the line. You know, as we we're saying about some of these staying novices, we haven't really seen a whole lot of them yet, but you'd have to be taken by what both Getaway done in Limerick. Mm. And then there was Jerry Colomb, who won at Dan Royal over two and a half miles. He was a quite a strong traveller, sound jumper. What did you make of this? Yeah, Jerry Colomb, Dennis O'Regan won on him in Dan Royal. And maybe that there wasn't you know, a whole lot in the race, but you, you'd be impressed what he'd done. And, you know, as you say, jump, travelled, ticked all the boxes so far going to have to prove a little bit more before we're chatting about him for Cheltenham but he, he has plenty of potential there. Definitely so if we have a look at the Albert Bartlett betting of course Blazing Cal tops that market we've seen him twice over here in Cheltenham he's kind of got a British type profile hasn't he in that he's been beating British trained horses um, uh, Jolino Bello twice uh, has, has now chased him home there's going to be some significant action you would think at the the Dublin Racing Festival where the likes of Hollow Games are going to be taking part. Yeah, and I suppose with Blazing Cal, it's quite interesting, you know, as you already mentioned, that he has been to Cheltenham twice already. And I think that might have been by design from Charles Burns. You know, Charles is thinking a long way ahead. From what I've seen of the horse so far, he looked very raw. And, you know, even through the middle part of his race, the last day, hurdles down the back straight he just wasn't jumping and doing what Donny McInerney was asking him to do down to the second last gives him a squeeze and he puts down didn't actually touch the hurdle but just lost a little bit of ground getting away from the back of it and picked up to win very nicely but you're looking at all of that thinking why has Charles gone to Cheltenham? I think he just wants the horse to have that experience over there, knowing how much of a baby he seems to be. Now, maybe the races aren't that competitive compared to what he's going to have to take on come March. But I think what Charles has made out a plan here, he'll go back to the Dublin Festival, see how he operates against some stiffer opposition but he's banked that previous Cheltenham experience, which is going to be vital come March. Yeah, that should be a huge advantage for him. Right, that's the stayers. We have one section left. That's the mares. So now it's time for the mares and we're looking at this group around the focus of the Dawn Run Mares Novices Hurdle at the Cheltenham Festival. Uh, let's take a look at a horse that really, I really like this performance over, over Christmas, Danny. This is Dino Blue, who made her race course debut and won in really good fashion at Clonmel. Yeah, it was a very good performance in Clonmel. She was back before the race as if the defeat was out of the question and, you know, beat two other stable mates of Willie Mullins is that, you know, are, are solid mares in their own right. And, you know, she jumped slick, moved through the race easily. Hernan in, I think, yeah, Paul Townend moved up beside her where you thought maybe there was going to be a race made of this. But as soon as she met the rising ground, you know, Blue was gone and ran out a very impressive winner again. And for a, a mare that's so inexperienced you know this really does promise quite a bit it, you know she might find quite a bit of improvement and that could take her sailing past her, her her opposition she's a half sister to blue sari who was second in the in the champion bumper but but previously so you know the, the breeding is all there as well yeah everything seems to match up and you know there's not many faults you can find with dino blue but the only thing is uh, she's going to have to contend with a few others from Willie Mons as well. Can you tell me about the ground at Clonmel that day? Because many, much of her opposition kept wide in the way that you did on, on Cashback and um, Paul did on, on um, Classic Getaway later on in, in, the, in the meeting. Dino Blue was a little bit more towards the inside. Was there any advantage about where to be on the track? I suppose later in the day, we all went a little bit wider as the ground down the inside was just starting to chew up a little bit more. From what I remember, 
Dino Blue was in the first race, so she would have had fresh ground down the inside. It was just, um, I don't think there was an advantage being wide early, but it was just fresher later in the day. OK, so it's something that developed later on. Um, you mentioned the opposition that she might face. One of them is uh, potentially her stable companion, Allegory de Vassy, who had experience in France and was quite impressive um, breaking her duck at Fairy House. Yeah, Allegory de Vassy won New Year's Day in Fairy House and you'd have to be impressed what she'd done late in the race. She won, picked up very well. But the only thing I, I have a question mark is through the early part of the race that you know, her jumping is just a little bit big. You know, she's she's losing that half length here and there uh, through the early part where you're looking at Dino Blue and I think she's a lot slicker and more of the finished article. The fact that Ali Gordovassi had a little bit of previous experience as well just doesn't suggest that she's going to sharpen up as much as you'd hope where Dino Blue, you know, first run and jump very slick two of them ability wise i think they're very similar jumping would put dino blue maybe ahead but the mayor's novice is run on the new course where there's very little jumping later in the race so jumping might not come into play as much for Cheltenham. yeah i think that's a fair point she's quite airy isn't she allegory uh she bloomed particularly early on some of her hurdles. She looks like she might be a chaser, doesn't she? I mean, she's got, she looked at, yeah, I mean, I can only see her on TV pictures. Does she have a scope? Yeah. Definitely. And, yeah. um, you know, it'll be interesting to see where she goes next year, but we'll worry about that then. <laughs> How about Glenn Zavantrim, also from the Willie Mullins Yard? She's a second season novice. It looked to me like she was found a very easy opportunity at Limerick. Is that fair? Yes. You know, if she hadn't, gone to Limerick and won the way she did you know you probably would be disappointed but you know it's still proof of life she's still there and she's <laughs> she's going to be battling away the fact that she has so much experience um is really going to stand to her between now and Cheltenham she's got a mark of 128 which could put her in line for a tilt at the Mayor's Handicap Earl at the Dublin Racing Festival. It's a 100 grand race. So that could be an interesting option before then. I'm, I'm not sure what uh, all of the connections will want to do. And, you know, Willie has plenty. JP will have plenty as well for that. But, you know, Glenza Mantrum has that experience that could go for, for one of those races. And she has enough experience that could go for a handicap in Cheltenham as well. Yeah, really good chat. The different sort of target for for her. Um, coming back to Britain, a rainy day woman won for the third time at Taunton. This often tends to be quite a decent little race. What did you make of it this year? Yeah, I thought it was a truly run race in Taunton. Harry Cobden bounced out, went a good gallop all the way, kept picking it up, picking it up all the way. You know, they're they're starting to get onto his tail off the home turn. It's just went down, jumped the second last, lengthened again, and kept picking up, hit the line very strong. I thought this was a good performance. And, you know, you're looking at Dino Blue and Ali Gordovassi, Lens of Antrim, you know, they, they're, they've solid performances in maiden hurdles where Rainy Day Woman, it's a, a good, truly run, listed race. And, you know, it was, it's probably a little bit ahead at the moment of, of what the Irish ones have achieved, but they, the Irish ones will improve an awful lot more. Looking at the betting then, um, and clearly Allegory de Vassi has, has impressed plenty of, of watchers. I like Dino Blue. I put Dino Blue up at eight to one, just because like you've argued, I think that, that she might just be ready now for hurdling. Um, but you, you've got insight on Statuaire. What do you think of her and Brandy Love? Yeah, Statuaire, I won the Royal Bond on her the last day. You know, she she's a mare that likes to drop in, come late. And most of the winners of the Mayor's Novice Hurdle tend to come from well off the pace. They go a good gallop down the straight on the new course so over that two miles. And it gets they start racing very early off the hill as well. So one closing off the pace might really suit uh, Statuaire's run style. And... 
as well. Brandy Love won in Nice. She was good. Um, won very well. Seemed professional in what she'd done. But like plenty of the others, she needs to step up again. It'll be interesting to see where she goes at the Dublin Festival. But then you're looking back and thinking of Grangie. Now, she's been in again the Geldings already. And for what Grangie has gained in experience in that mm-hmm. defeat in Leopardstown, and I'd say maybe a slight change in tactics, she showed a good turn of foot to get into the race. I'm sure she'll probably be delivered a little bit later, which would suit the mayor's office in Cheltenham. And you can't put her out of the race as well. You know, she's had a good bit of experience last year to her bumper season. A few good runs, one well at Fairy House. You know, disappointing in Leperstown, but she can bounce back from that. She's not out with the mayor's novice as well. Yeah, I very much agree. And uh, West Balboa for the Skeletons as well got experience to get the novices in, in the cello. They've also got L.A. Bell, who interestingly, they entered in the Close Brothers mayor's hurdle as well against much more experienced mayors. Um, we'll talk about those entries uh, ne- in next week's show. Uh, right. We need to head towards um, wrapping up this show, Danny. You've been absolutely fantastic. I hope you've enjoyed it. Have you? Definitely, yeah, it's been good. <laughs> it's the right answer. What else could you say in these circumstances? So looking ahead to the weekend, there's some good action. We've mentioned the Moscow Flyer. We've mentioned the racing at Warwick, but a certain Bob Ollinger is going to be back. That should be interesting, um, Danny. He's missed some targets, a couple of potential targets in Britain and in Ireland, um, and Henry has waited for the Kildare Novice Chase at Punchestown on Sunday. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see him out again. You know, he, he put up a solid performance in Gorn the first day. Maybe a little bit lacklustre how he got down the home straight. And Sunday is going to be a good test to see where he's going from Cheltenham and the bigger spring festival. It certainly is. And over here in Britain, we're looking forward to the great two Sylvaniaki Conti chase. And we might see Venetia Williams, Fanny Ann Destreval there. And that horse is quite exciting. I think the Kempton track should suit him. Danny, thank you very much for your company today. Um, best of luck for the weekend and for the for the rest of the season. Thank you all at home for watching Road to Cheltenham. Don't forget about the column, which you can find at racingtv.com forward slash Road to Cheltenham. That details the bets that I've mentioned during the course of this show and everything else that has gone on in the novice hurdling world over the festive period. But for now, it is goodbye. See you next week. The home of jump racing. This is where the magic happens. Feel like a Cheltenham favourite with Paddy Power.